Sacrifice is the act of giving up something for something. Sacrifice is surrendering something of value. Sacrifice is facing your fears. Sacrifice is leaving family, friends, and community behind. Sacrifice is great loss for greater victories. Sacrifice is adding meaning Sacrifice to life. Is Sacrifice is to make an action worthwhile. Sacrifice is gaining ground. Sacrifice is standing up for what is right. Sacrifice is facing great Sacrifice is Sacrifice is pride in the nation. Sacrifice is action. Sacrifice is 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 Wolso Yinka once said, A war with this attendant human suffering must, when that evil is unavoidable, be made to fragment more than buildings. It must shatter the foundations of thought and recreate. Only in this way does every individual share in the cataclysm and understand the purpose of sacrifice. The students today, the young people today, need to understand that freedom isn't free, that it requires sacrifice. I'm afraid that over time, people have lost that message, and, and we need to try to find a way to convey that. What came out of that was the Albert H. Small Normandy Institute. And the idea is to have students study about World War II and about the Normandy campaign, and in particular, learn about one individual, preferably from very close to where the student grow, grew up so in their hometown and somebody who has a background much like theirs would have had the same experiences that they did growing up but who because their country called them put their own plans and hopes and dreams on hold joined the army and went off to fight in Normandy to oppose the tyranny that was Nazism and Japanese imperialism on a global basis every one of those people had families and ideals and dreams they wanted to carry out for their lives and they were not able to come back to do that because they sacrificed so that the rest of us would have the freedoms that we so enjoy today. After the trip, my biggest takeaway has probably um, been to not take anything for granted um, because after doing all the research on Private, jo or Private Jordan and uh, um, his life and his experience during the war, it really put things into perspective about how easy um, we have it today and how, how grateful we should be for um, the lives that we're able to live today. So just coming back, I've always um, just have that in the back of my mind that things could be worse. I could be in his situation um, where he lost his life at the, in his 20s, so he never got to you know, live a full life. Um, so it's just something to be grateful for. Figuratively, I brought back memories and things that, especially friendships, friendships between me and my fellow Normie scholars like Evelyn, Josh, Jacob, Liam, you know, everyone else who was also part of the trip, and also memories and, you know, getting a deeper relationship with my own Normandy teacher, Mr. Logan, and also getting a deeper connection with my uh, silent hero, William, Private William C. Cooper of the 101st Airborne Division, who I had the prestigious honor of eulogizing at his gravesite in the Normandy American Cemetery. It was by far the most emotional moment of the trip, besides going uh, to the beaches themselves, particularly Omaha Beach, but. It was something that I came back with, you know, it just kind of reaffirmed a lot of my desire to be, you know, engaging in my community and also my desire to be doing something in, you know, in civil service and something that I can do to serve my country, similar to how Private Cooper was able to serve his country. Every year when I do this, I'm struck by how hard the students have worked how much they seem to feel as though they grew up next door to this soldier who died on that sand for our freedom, um, and they came, became friends with them, and it's as though they really knew them. I think the experiences that 
I've had over the course of studying my silent hero and his journey has really changed my perspective on my own journey. I think in one of the ways, well, in one way, my silent hero dropped out of school um, after the seventh grade. So he never graduated high school. Um, and that has given me a new perspective on my own education. Um, and to a larger extent, I'm able to be more grateful for the opportunities and the blessings that I have because of my perspective on his own life. Seeing the challenges and the obstacles that he faced and he struggled with has given me the courage to face my own struggles head on. I think one of the biggest takeaways for me from this trip uh, was the impact it had on my teaching. Um, one of the things that I'm striving to do now is make it a possibility for more students to dig into the archives, dig into the process that we went through, and to try to track down some of these stories, whether it's from their family members or you know a neighbor that they had. But I just want more of these stories to be held on to and preserved for the future. Going to Normandy with this story. So everybody who participates has, has studied about a soldier and they know what that soldier did. We then go to France and we walk on the sand at Omaha Beach. The sand that the boys from Bedford, Virginia landed on at 6.30 in the morning on the 6th of June 1944 in the dog green sector of Omaha Beach where the terrible events that are dramatized in Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan actually took place. And you walk out there and it hasn't been developed and so the beach looks a lot like it did in 1944. And you can imagine what it was like for those young men to land on that beach and to go through what they did. And to fight their way up um, the hills and then capture Virville Draw and move to the interior. Uh, one of the cool things about our instructors, they set it up so that we're going to Omaha Beach right when the tide was at the same part when we stormed the beaches on D-Day. And so as we walk out there and we're looking at the expanse and the flatness of Omaha Beach, we got to see basically how far they had to run to make it to safety, which was, I'm gonna say, more than 100 yards, which is a football field. Now, the incredible thing about that is we had the very great fortune of carrying our uh, suitcases from the plane that were 50 pounds and through our study we learned that the backpacks that the soldiers had to carry was 70 pounds and so to sit there at the beach reflect on an understanding that they're carrying 70 pounds on their backpack which was our suitcase on our backpack having to run up this flat ground with no coverage with german bunkers uh, with full of artillery and guns firing at them how impossible this feat was just the moment of sitting there and looking at, at, at what was done was amazing. We go into the cemetery and we lay a wreath and they play taps in the Star Spangled Banner and then each student gives a eulogy for his or her soldier standing by their graveside and it's enormously powerful. That experience, walking that sand and then being in that cemetery with those immaculate white headstones imposes on people the importance of this message that no other way possibly can. The German cemetery, which is uh, for me a very om ominous location due to the fact that they don't have any tombstones. They have in random locations these three crosses and the colors that they use Brown, they don't use black. right they don't use the, the white or the gray which is typical of what you see um, in graveyards. Well, they use this very brown blackish stone and in the middle you have this giant hill with a statue and one of the noticeable things about the statue is that they're angels and typically when you see the angels, the angels are looking down guarding the dead. These angels are looking up and away from the dead and it's almost as though they're looking and in, in being ashamed of what was happening. Yeah. In the German cemetery where they have their uh, location for their chapel, at the very top is decorated with one giant word, Pax, which means peace. The 
whole time you're walking around the cemetery, it feels like you're looking down on the soldiers. Um, and it was very upsetting. Um, it was very quiet on the bus when we all got back home because um, you come out of like the British cemetery um, and you know there's flowers everywhere, everything's light and um, and just there's a sense of respect but coming out of that one it just felt wrong. The most impactful moment of the Normandy Institute for me was our day in Normandy American Cemetery. When we walked into that cemetery I instantly realized two things in ways I just never quite had before when we were conducting our research at home. The first was that this was the final resting place of my silent hero, the man I had been researching for many months, uncovering as much as I possibly could about. And so then I knew it was my responsibility that afternoon to give him the eulogy that he deserved and to honor him in the best possible way that I could as a Normandy scholar. And I also realized that every marble headstone that we saw that afternoon signified the life of a man who was every bit unique for my silent hero but a life that was every bit complex and meaningful and significant as my silent heroes. Going to the U.S. cemetery, you think you're ready for this, but when you come in, we're all kind of, you know, we're quiet. We know we're about to pay our respects, but as you enter into the cemetery, it's overwhelming the feeling that you get because you actually see the expanse, the loss. And I was standing in the atrium and looking out across those graves was just absolutely overwhelming. Um, and then having to deliver on uh, processing the dead and I'm talking about how they moved these men there and how they came to rest there, it, it was one of the most overwhelming things I've ever experienced. And like for me, I'm not an emotional individual, but as she's delivering her message, I, I can't help it. I, I, I start crying uncontrollably. And it wasn't just us, I mean everyone, it, it hit everyone extremely hard. <laughs> It became very real and serious, and what then, sacrifice means. Yeah, and once you start walking down that brick path, you're going by like rows and rows. And we actually, I was the first eulogy, so we came from the atrium and then walked all the way towards the back. Um, and it just, to see the huge amount of numbers was, I can't even describe it. Overwhelming. My soldier's body was never recovered, so I had to recite his eulogy beside a wall of hundreds of other names of other personnel whose bodies were never found. Um, this was extremely hard on me. Um, many of the other te student teacher teams were able to kind of gain a sense of closure by reciting it by a grave, but I didn't ever get that sense. I had to recite it by hundreds of other names of other peoples whose families continued to just wallow in their own misery and grief about not that their children were probably dead, but that they would never get any kind of sense of closure. They, they would never know for sure what happened or how they died, and that's incredibly heartbreaking. I cannot, no matter how much I wish, to put you all in 747s and ship you to Normandy, but I can tell my story and my soldier's story. Because his story matters. All those buried there, or here, in fact, matter. They are and have been forgotten. In this world today, we have lost sight of the sense of purpose and drive those men and women had. They deserve the honor that is so often lost. We cannot simply write it down and recall it. We have to preserve this ultimate feat of not only military strategy, but individual strength and character. I have come home with this new sense of duty to speak for those who cannot to share their stories, their childhoods, their military prowess, and their ultimate sacrifice. Private Garney L. Grizzle, the sixth child of nine of Lewis and Rebecca Grizzle, grew up in a small farming community in Union County, Georgia, near what is now Blairsville. Private Grizzle was born in approximately 1924 in a small, isolated town of enduring survivors. Cooper's Creek, where Private Grizzle spent his childhood, lacked electricity or roads and a one-room schoolhouse served the children of the community. Private Grizzle was forced to leave his schooling after the third grade to farm beside his father and siblings, and that became his life before the war. However, a storm was looming over the south, and it was not the much-needed rain. The Great Depression had hit the small town with a devastating force. Children dropped out of school to help with the crops. Every hand was needed to put food on the table. Farming alongside his father and young, younger siblings, struggling through the Depression, this was his childhood, to be summarized as a hard life of dust and meager meals. 
In addition to the difficult conditions, after dropping out of school, Private Grizzle was met with tragedy. His mother, Rebecca, passed. And then it was his father and his siblings that remained in the house without the matriarch to balance the meals between the table and the market. In early 1942, Private Grizzle was drafted and assigned to the 2nd Division of the 23rd Infantry Regiment. His division, nicknamed the Indian Heads, was first moved to Northern Ireland in late 1943 and to England in April of 1944. The infantrymen of the 23rd were all rookies, but the commanding officers were all veterans of World War I. Private Grizzle's division would land on the Omaha Beach on June 7, 1944 with the objective of capturing Hill 192, a German stronghold. The rookie regiment were to be the point of the spear. They would march 20 miles inland and 4 miles east of the Wardhorn town of St. Lowe. The hill that loomed ominously before them was guarded by a 16,000-man German parachute division. It was one of the most heavily guarded areas in the American portion of the front. The company saw small battles along the way, but it was clear this would not be a new form of combat. Their old-fashioned spring fields, left over from World War I, just would not cut it anymore. Bill Duddis, who served in the 38th Infantry Regiment alongside the 23rd, also initially carried Springfields. The disadvantages of a bolt-action rifle in the close combat of the hedgerows quickly became clear. Duddis stated, and I quote, we threw our Springfields in a heap and picked up M1s. Private Garney Grizzle was killed in the German counterattack on June 13, 1944. It was in this battle that the American forces retreated in defeat and Private Grizzle fell. He was shot through the head and killed instantly while defending his company on Hill 192. By July, the 2nd Division of the 23rd Regiment would succeed in taking the hill, establishing a much needed hole in the German front that Operation Cobra could utilize, making Private Grizzle's sacrifice valuable and awarding him the Purple Heart. Through the Grave Registration Services and the War Department, Private Grizzle's father was notified. Lewis Grizzle decided to leave Private Grizzle's body overseas to lie in the Normandy Cemetery. It was Private Grizzle's sister, Lizzie, who requested information on Private Grizzle's whereabouts and the details of the death, burial, and care of the cemetery. Lizzie was told of the victory that led to the liberation of Hill 192, and most importantly of her brother's contribution to that vital victory. Each of us has been touched with a knowledge more personal than any learned from a textbook. We have stepped into a life and we have stepped out breathing hard with pounding hearts and shimmering eyes. Wisdom is a powerful thing. Our wisdom is a new definition of sacrifice, a new definition of what it meant for these soldiers, for Private Grizzle, to stand up for the United States against death itself. That wisdom is now ours, to be carried and more importantly shared. Because what we hold in our hearts, our hands, and our minds is a powerful message of a lifetime, a sacrifice, and a victory. Coming home, I was an absolute surety of one thing, Private Grizzle was a silent hero among thousands that lie there in the Normandy American Cemetery and national cemeteries across the nation. I will forever tell his story. Why? Because I am a Normandy scholar.